Okay, now I want to talk to you about a very different uh, woman artist. Um, very different is socially, they have friends in common. Uh, stylistically, she's different. Uh, her name is Susan Valadon, and you, she knows the Impressionist uh, and the post-Impressionist. I don't think we can call her an Impressionist. Her style certainly doesn't support it. Uh, but you could call her a post-Impressionist. I don't know that at that time that word would have had any meaning at all, uh, hadn't been coined. Um, but basically she's uh, learning from Impressionists and, imp and just all sorts of artists and doing something um, that is they, that they saw as very honest and fresh and bold. And so let's take a look at uh, Suzanne Valadon and uh, her artwork. Um, we have a photograph of her, and a very, very pretty young lady, as you can see. Um, she is from a totally different social class than the other artists we've talked about, uh, Moriso, Cassatt. Uh, they would have had no connection with her at all. Um, Susan Valadon was an illegitimate child. Uh, one book says seamstress. I found on the web people saying of a laundress. I think what happened, I'm guessing here, but I think probably the, the mother was a seamstress. Um, the book I said that she was seduced by a miller and um, in shame uh, moved from the small town she lived in to Paris. Uh, where she wasn't, I assumed that she ended up doing laundry to, to make a living. Um, she also took to drink. So it was a very, very bad situation for any child. Um, her name, the, uh, Suzanne, was not her birth name. Her birth name was Marie Clementine Valadon. And she essentially was a, a street child. I mean, she got little education. Uh, I think she went to a convent school for a very short amount of time. And, you know, she was basically out on the street. Uh, she had to start making her own living when she was nine years old and uh, apprenticed as a dressmaker in a sweatshop where she was for three or four years. Um, she tried all sorts of jobs, whatever she could get, waitress, dishwasher, probably laundress, peddled vegetables. Uh, I even found a reference that said she served as a groom in a livery stable. I don't know, how did she do that? <laughs> um, but what they always mention is the fact that she got a job with the circus. And she was, uh, at age 15, a trapeze artist. Alas, at age 16, uh, she fell. And she had to find something <laughs> that she could do without you know, falling off the trapeze. Um, and at that time, she became an artist model. And she was a much sought after model. Uh, people of all different styles, you know, used her as a model. Um, she saw she was very beautiful. Um, and she had uh, many sexual affairs. Uh, she had an illegitimate son uh, who became a very famous painter, uh, Maurice Utrillo. Um, he although I think he was addicted to drugs and alcohol and all sorts of things. I remember one of my professors said of him, you would never low looking at his pictures. <laughs> um, now, I mentioned that Mary Cassatt and Berthe Morisot could not hang out in the Montmartre cafes. Um, Susan Valadon could because she was a woman of loose virtue, I guess, and uh, so she hung out in the cafes. And she had affairs with, uh, I suppose, most of the artists, uh, probably not all of them. Uh, no one suggested she had an affair with Degas, uh, but she was supposed to have had an uh, affair with uh, Puvis de Chavannes. Uh, she was 17, he was something like 57, so there's a 40, 40 year gap there. And he's supposed to have fallen madly in love with her. Uh, that happened, there was a, there was a composer who she had a, an affair with, and he, he just wasn't interested in anybody else after that. Um, she appears in many famous paintings. I'm not showing you all of them. Uh, there she is uh, posing for Pouvet, and uh, here is a portrait of her painted by Renoir, 
And we can find her in a number of, of paintings uh, by Renoir. Um, I didn't bring that one in, but there's one where uh, they're dancing, and uh, she's the dancer. Uh, and if you look at his uh, famous bathers uh, from 1887, uh, the young slim girl in the lower uh, right foreground uh, is Susan Valadon. Uh, this is the woman braiding her hair, which is another uh, picture of, of Susan Valadon. Um, we said she had lots of d different affairs with different people. Um, and the one that lasted the longest, well, I didn't count the, the other one. There were two that lasted quite a long time. Uh, one was a uh, respectable guy, a banker, and uh, a number of people said she was married to him for 14 years, but I also found that she was living with him as his wife, so I guess like a common law wife, um, pretending to be, you know, church married or legally married. Um, and uh, it, that was her period where she was living in a respectable part of town and uh, supposedly behaving like a sp or, or the illusion of a respectable woman. Um, and after 14 years, she pretty much got fed up and she left. And uh, by this time, her son is, you know, an adult and he has a friend whose name is Andre Uter. Uh, and she falls in love with him, and he falls in love with her, or whatever. Anyway, they have an affair, uh, and then uh, he's called up to be drafted into, into uh, World War I. Um, and at that time, they get married. He is wounded, but he does survive the war. Um, she's 21 years older than he is. So um, she must have been quite a woman. <laughs> uh, and that uh, lasts for quite some time. They actually are a, a kind of threesome. They live together, uh, they work together, they fight together. <laughs> um, um, here we have a not terribly flattering picture of her, although her features are still quite uh, lovely and strong, but here they make them sort of pointed and sharp uh, with this uh, drawing uh, by uh, Toulouse-Lautrec, The Hangover. Uh, he may have been angry. I found one website that said he was angry with her because she had broken off their affair. Uh, but at any rate, um, they were they were good friends for a while. Um, whether it was an affair or not, I don't know. Um, but uh, Toulouse Lautrec rented a studio in the same building where Valadon and her mother were living. And um, like I said, they became good friends. And Susan Valadon became uh, the hostess to all of Toulouse Lautrec's lavish parties. And uh, Toulouse-Lautrec uh, saw her, well, gave her all sorts of advice about living and art and everything else. And he was the one who suggested she change her name to Suzanne. I don't know quite why, but uh, maybe he thought it was more appropriate for an artist or an art or a, a model. Now, Valadon didn't have the advantages of formal art training. But you know she's being painted by these artists, and she's she's obviously uh, intelligent. Uh, she observes the artists, and she starts to draw on her own. And she really you know gets dedicated. She wants to work like mad, not to produce beautiful drawings to be hung and framed, to be framed and hung on a wall, but good drawings that capture a moment of life in movement, in all its intensity. So that's what she's trying to do. Um, but at first, you know, nobody knows about it. Nobody knows she's doing this. Uh, in 1884, uh, she's working. Renoir comes in. He looks at her at first, you know, probably to scoff. And then he looks at her and says, wow, oh, yo, oh, you, too. And you hide this talent? But he didn't give her any help. You know who gave her help? Degas. Now, Toulouse-Lautrec, and Degas had an argument, essentially. And Degas claimed that the great draftsmanship, the great drawing uh, that uh, you know, artists had could be found only by studying great art. And Toulouse Trek says, nope, I can prove you wrong. I'm going to show you somebody who hasn't been able to study great art and has great drawing naturally. We might say by talent. And um, so he sends Susan Valadon over with a portfolio and a note 
And uh, because we've got the note, uh, Degas lets her in, he looks at the art, and he says, yes, it is true, you are indeed one of us. And then he does something about it, rather than just saying, oh yeah, wow, good. Um, he encourages her, he urges her not just to draw, but to paint. And he, start, he teaches her some drawing techniques, and he teaches her how to do etchings. And then he arranges gallery shows for her. Not these aren't one man shows yet, uh, but you know that the that her work would be in a gallery, uh, could be seen and hopefully purchased. And I had a little trouble finding some of the early work, but I found one. <laughs> so, um, In 1895, Vollard, um, Vollard was a very, very famous art dealer, and he's the one who got post-impressionists and the early modernists their shows. Um, and uh, so he's showing all this, you know, sort of new art. So he does show 12 of her etchings. This is, this is probably one of them. Um, it's kind of a descriptive title, Catherine Prepares the Bath. So Catherine must be the older woman, uh, while Louise does her hair. Okay, everyday scene. Um, she's using very bold and crude, crude lines, we might say, uh, very unidealized, which um, the people who saw these felt that they were very honest and, and uh, direct and true. I think, this is, I think this is the picture that's in your textbook, uh, a bit later, but um, a, a further development, as you can see, her uh, skills are growing. Um, you have a grandmother and a young girl stepping into a bath, so you have this uh, generation, I, was, I don't know, generation gap, but uh, two people from uh, different generations. Uh, it's a drawing uh, with uh, bold, strong lines. Um, and it, it, this kind of drawing was perceived as very unpretentious, very honest. Uh, one of the things that she does is she has the, her figures in very awkward poses. You know, she says, I'm not trying to do pretty pictures. I'm not trying to do beautiful pictures to hang on the wall. I want them to be honest and true. Good drawings that capture a moment of life in movement in all its intensity. So there's still that uh, impressionist idea of the moment in time, you know, the, the fleeting moment. Um, here it's a bit different, of course. Uh, the, there's nothing of the impressionist style of uh, loose brushwork and uh, light uh, uh, shimmering and uh, broken into its component parts. Um, so that's why I say you, she's associated with the impressionist painters, people like Renoir and Degas, but uh, she herself is not working with an impressionist style, probably more post-impressionist. One of the interesting things about many of her pictures is the, the figures are facing away. You know, traditionally you would have your nude figures, and she knows well this because she's been a model, your nude figures on display for, of course, the male artist, but also the male viewer. And uh, her figures, you can see here, it's, it's a kind of, um, you know, close-up intimate view, but She's not paying any attention to us. Even the grandmother isn't looking at us. Uh, presumably, we're not there. <laughs> so uh, so uh, it's, it's not the idea of the, the beautiful young lady who's lounging in her bath. Uh, it's the awkwardness of trying to get into this tub. And of course, this is a tub that has to be uh, heated with uh, water warmed on the stove, which you see there. Here is a pastel called After the Bath. And uh, the uh, screen hides the bathtub, uh, except you can see a little bit of it at the side. And uh, the woman's gotten out of the tub and is presumably dried, dried or drying herself out and uh, kind of climbing into this chair. Uh, once again, you know, she's not looking at us. She's not displaying our, herself beautifully lounging there. It's a very awkward pose. And then you have a mother and child theme uh, where they're bathing. Um, you know, this is uh, poor people, don't get maybe a big bathtub, uh, they're bathing in a little basin. And this is a charcoal drawing. She did one, at least one uh, traditional theme, 
uh, where she could show nude figures, and you'll see that many of her, she does, she does uh, still lifes and flowers and things like that too, uh, but she's probably best known for her nudes. Um, and so we see the, what is it, the, the prototype nudes of all time, Adam and Eve, the first parents. Um, I don't know who the model is for the uh, Eve, but the model for Adam was her lover, and uh, she, I'm not sure what she had. I don't think she, I don't think she, no, she hadn't married him by this time, um, Andre Uter. And as you can see here, she's bringing in color. Um, the the uh, forms uh, are defined by these very bold lines, uh, and uh, the colors are um, really building up the forms. And here it's quite contrasting colors, greens with the little bits of reds or oranges. And here, um, the woman at the toilet from uh, 1913 is a very bold, strong, powerful form. Um, we have, for example, the servant who's uh, preparing the bath uh, and the, or cleaning up afterwards or whatever. Uh, the woman's not looking at it, she's looking out, she's looking away. Uh, she's got her own agenda. She's not interested in us. <laughs> um, she, find, she got her one-woman show in uh, 1915, and it got good reviews. Uh, here's one of the things it says. Uh, this extraordinary woman is passion itself. She paints solidly. So by this time, there is some acceptance. Remember, we, they've seen... Matisse's and Picasso's and <laughs> all sorts of things, by Cubism and all sorts of things has, has started at this point. Um, so this isn't as uh, perhaps radical as if she'd been doing it some uh, while before. Uh, it's becoming acceptable. <laughs>